September. Now, last time was a couple weeks ago. Uh, we had a, a missionary here last year kind of sharing his own adventures in Indonesia. So just to catch you up, last time we looked at Amos, we were looking at the day of the Lord. That is when Jesus returns. And uh, for Christians, it's wonderful because we get to meet Jesus face to face again. For those who are not in Jesus, it's actually a terrible day, a day of destruction. Right? For, that's for the people who are worshiping their own God that they have made and not the God of the Bible. So that's where we were before. And now we're going to move on to two more woes. And I know some people want a, a, a hook, something to think about as we're going through the sermon. And I'll tell you the, uh, the overall framework here is we're going to be looking at the pride of mankind and the humility of Jesus. That's the topic. So if you want to think about that as we go through the text, but... First, I want to explain the text before I describe how it all ties together. So we'll start in verses 1 to 3. That's our first woe section. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria, the notable men of the first of the nations, to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Calneh and see, and from there go to Hamath the Great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is your territory greater than their... Or is their territory greater than your territory? O oh, you who put far away the disaster and bring near the seat of violence. So this is woe to the rich and the powerful, the movers and the shakers in Zion and in Samaria. Now Zion, that's another name for Jerusalem, and that's a capital of a southern kingdom known as Judah. And at that time, the northern kingdom was known as Israel, and their capital was the city Samaria. So it's actually woe to the movers and shakers in both of these places. And together, these are the, the 12 tribes which make up what is called the foremost nation of the world, or Israel. Right? That's what, uh, that's what this means, the first of the nations. And the text says, woe to those who are at ease. Now other translations put, might put woe to those who are complacent. Right? Those who are comfortable, kind of sitting on your laurels, that kind of thing. And it's funny because I actually had this whole sermon, like I, I, I read the whole text and I figure, okay, what's the main idea here? Okay, it's pride. What's the opposite of pride? Well, that's humility. That's what we're going to talk about. And I was looking, okay, well, I got to talk about complacency at the beginning. So I opened my Hebrew dictionary and well, it turns out the word complacency, another translation for it is arrogant. And I was like, well, look, it is about pride. <laughs> so I don't, even have to, I don't even have to stretch on this one. Right? And, and the, the, the reason is the people are at ease because they think, oh, I'm too good for that. Bad things can't happen to me. I'm not going to fall into that trap. I'm not going to be destroyed by that. I, I, I'm good. Why, why would anyone want to destroy me? Right? That's that, that pride talking. They think because they're in the best nation and because they're the best people in the best nation that they're safe. Right? But they are not. Now in verse 2, Amos invites these notable men to take a look and look at these cities, Calneh and Hamath the Great, and go down to Gath of the Philistines. And the question is, do you think you're better than them? Right? When you look around at the other nations, you think, oh yeah, I'm way better than them. I'm not going to... Ha what happened to them is not what's going to happen to me. Now these cities have just been captured. So we know that um, Hamath was captured by Jeroboam. He's the king of the northern kingdom Israel. And Gath of the Philistines was just captured by Uzziah. And he's currently the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. So these cities had just been captured. Now Gath, you may not know where that is. It's actually been destroyed now, but there's a city very close to it that you might know. It's Gaza. Right? Also one of the famous five famous cities of the Philistines. So to put this in today's context, we could just say, look, look at Gaza. You think you're better than they are? No, you're not. Right? We are all people. Now, verse 3 finishes this little section. He says, you who put away far the day of disaster. That's that day of the Lord again. You think it's not coming for you? You think you can go around with violence and there won't be judgment? No. Men of bloodshed are, are judged by the Lord. The day of the Lord is coming. Right? People think they can just go around bombing and sending rockets and all this, and there will never be any repercussions. Well, honey, you got another thing coming. Right? That's, that's basically what Amos is saying. Now, in our next section, verses 4 to 7, we get one more woe. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory, stretch themselves out on their couches, eat lambs from the flock, calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, and like David, invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls, anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. So really here, the, <clears throat> the problem here, it doesn't appear to be 
riches per se, but rather abundance here. It's like you're not sleeping on a bed made of wood or metal. It's made out of ivory. You know how expensive ivory is? Right? To have an, and it always was expensive. To have a whole bed made out of ivory, right? How many elephants would have to die to make that kind of a bed? That's, 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 really, that's really wasteful. And it's not you're just drinking a cup of wine. No, you're drinking wine by a bowlful. Right? It's, it's not just, okay, I, I just want a little sip of wine to help my stomach or to, to ease the pain of the day or whatever. This is, hey, I need a whole bowl of wine. And I'm not just going to you know, use some nice shampoo or anointing oil, but I've got to get the finest, the finest and the best. Now, what else do we have here? Oh, yeah, they're not just singing. They're not just singing songs. It's not they're just listening to the top 40, but they're actually going out and inventing new instruments. Because, okay, the top 40 is not even good enough for me. I need, I need the latest and the greatest in music. Right? They're just going to excess here. Now, <clears throat> this is about a rich celebration. And, uh, okay, we'll go on to verse 7. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. So these people who are doing this, they're, they're living, living large. And we know from other chapters in Amos that they're getting this money from, from unrighteous taxes. They're actually, they're actually stealing from the poor people, basically. Um, that's where they're getting these riches. And then Amos says, well, this is coming for you. Now, this text doesn't directly deal with pride. I'm not going to force my framework onto it. But, you know, here's, here's a different sin. It doesn't really have to do with pride. Yes, riches can lead to pride. It is a source of pride for many people. Look how, look how my, my nice my car is or whatever. Right, but <clears throat> I think the problem here too is the wrong season. Right here, these people are celebrating while their nation is rotting. And the Bible actually tells us to grieve with those who grieve. So while our nation is rotting, we should be lamenting. Right. Okay, I just want to close this section because it doesn't really fit with my, the rest of my theme of pride. But I do want to just let Jesus talk on this section. So I'm going to close with something from Luke six. Luke 6. He actually has a very similar passage to this, and we're not going to go much into it. I just, <clears throat> I didn't know what to say, so I was like, well, okay, let's ask Jesus. Let's see what he has to say. Um, chapter 6, verse 20. Jesus lifted up his eyes on, the, on his disciples, and he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Well, let's go back to Amos and move on in the sermon. Chapter 6 of Amos, verse 8. Oh, no, I'm in the wrong chapter here. Chapter 6, verse 8. The Lord God has sworn by himself, declares the Lord, the God of hosts. I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his strongholds. I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. So here comes the declaration, right? And here you can clearly see the first half of our topic. This is the pride of mankind. God says, I abhor it. That's another word for hate. I actually hate the pride of Jacob here. And you can see they're taking pride in their fortresses. Uh, the way Mia read it was palaces. It's the same kind of idea. Right? He actually hates these things that they're thinking, oh, look, look how strong my military is. Look how strong my fortress is. Look how nice my palace is. Well, actually, that makes them prideful, and God hates that. Pride is always a sin. In fact, Proverbs tell us there's seven things God hates. We have a list of this. Proverbs 6, 16 Six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes. That word haughty, we don't use it a lot. It means prideful, arrogant. When you lift, you're looking down your nose at other people, right? That is that, that pride. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, 
feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Right? That's the seven things that are an abomination to God. And you see the very first on the list is haughty eyes. Pride is very right at the beginning there. In fact, John, he kind of splits up all the sins of the world into three categories in 1 John 2.16. We're just going to do the one verse here. He says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Now, it's kind of like he's splitting up all the sins of the world into three categories. Either it comes lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, or pride of life. That's when you think you are better than others, or you think you are above your own place in the world. <clears throat> And so actually, as we look through Amos, all these sins mentioned, you can probably think about like drunkenness and living in this revelry, this abundant lifestyle. It comes from, you know, either desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, or the pride of life, right? All the, all the sins that we see in Amos, complacency, they all come from one of those three sources. <clears throat> now we'll go on back to uh, Amos chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Here comes the judgment. If ten men remain in one house, they shall die. When one's relative, the one who anoints him for burial, shall take him up to bring the bones out of the house, shall say to him who is in the innermost part of the house, Is there still anyone with you? He shall cry, No. And he shall say, Silence, we must not mention the name of the Lord. So almost everybody's going to die. You got ten people in a house. They're going to die because of this pride. That's how, that's how bad it is. And even if there's a single person left, they're going to say, I can't even pray because I don't want to mention God's name because then his eye will come upon me. That's how far they're going to be from God where they'll be ashamed to even utter his name, to even think about the Lord and talk about him. This is a serious judgment here just coming from this pride. And actually, the judgment does continue in verse 11. He says, For behold, the Lord commands, the great house shall be struck down into fragments, and even the little house shall be struck into bits. Do horses run on rocks? Does one plow there with oxen? But you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. So the thing here with the horses and the oxen is that it's unnatural, right? Uh, you're not going to go take your, take your oxen and go plowing a, a rocky mountain, right? Because what are they going to plow? You know, I know we got a couple farmers here. You know, you, you want to go plow soil, right? It doesn't make sense. And in the same way, being prideful is not natural. It's not part of God's created order. He created the world. He created it good. And then sin entered the world through one man, whose name I always forget. I don't know, maybe you can help me out. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Adam. That's my name. For, yeah, okay. <clears throat> And that is how the pride of life entered the world, right? That's a perversion of reality. God makes this good world, and we corrupt it. And so it is the same thing with the Israelites here. They were turning justice into poison. Justice is supposed to be good. It's supposed to be healing. It's supposed to be helpful and loving. They turn it into poison that's hurtful. And righteousness, it's supposed to be beautiful and wonderful. They turn it into wormwood, which is the most bitter thing. So basically what he's saying is that God's righteousness, it used to be taste delicious like honey but actually they've taken righteousness and they've corrupted it and they, they made it taste like when you throw up in your mouth and you swallow it again it's bitter it's disgusting okay that's what they've done they've they've ruined the very fabric of the world now we'll finish here verse 13 and 14 you who rejoice in lodabar who say have we not by our own strength captured karnim for ourselves for behold, I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, declares the Lord, the God of hosts, and they shall oppress you from Lebo Hamath to the brook of the Arabah. So the people of Israel are rejoicing in these small, insignificant towns that they had captured. They are patting themselves on the back, thinking, oh yeah, this was us. It was our own strength that did this. Look how good we are. That's pride talking again. And so God will send another nation, now, for us, this is the past. We can actually look and see this happened. The nation of Assyria came and conquered uh, Israel and brought them into captivity. So there's the problem. Pride. Is it still a problem today? Yes, it is. It is still a problem today. It is rampant. We are a super, super individualistic society. That means we think about me. Well, sometimes we think about I, Sometimes myself, 
sometimes mine, right? These are the, the four big topics in our society, and that results in pride. It impacts everything. It's in our economy, because the question for our economy is not, well, what is the best thing for you? The question is, well, what do you want, right? And that's what all the advertisements are about. What do you want? What's good for, for you? The customer is always right. You ever hear that? Well, you hear that enough, and eventually you start to believe it. And you actually, it leads you into pride. Sometimes I talk to people on the street, and they say, well, that's good for you, but this is my truth. As if people are master of the reality, and they get to decide what is true and what is false. Right? That is, that is pride talking there. It actually, it happens in, in, in church as well. Right? Countless people separate from churches because they think, well, I know all the doctrines, so my doctrine is the correct doctrine, and anyone who disagrees with me must be wrong. It must be ungodly. And so they just walk away, sometimes over super trivial issues, right? Like what, what color to paint the nursery or something like that, right? And sometimes the most ridiculous things, but that, that is prideful, right? That, that, is not, that is not godly. I see it when people refuse to listen to experts or institutions, because they think, well, I know better than them. How, how could somebody who studied it their whole life know more than I do? I, re I read about it for 15 minutes, you know? And so that is pride talking, right? And, and pride is the one thing that actually keeps you from the gospel. Because pride actually causes people, when they need help, to not ask for help. So I want to share an illustration with you. And I actually have a, an illustration for the, for the slide here. Here's an illustration of stairs, so... There was a man, he had a, he had a little daughter. And he said to his daughter, okay, I need you to climb these stairs, but the rule is you can't touch anything painted. So you can't touch the stairs, you can't touch the walls, you can't touch the banister, and I need you to get to the top. And so she tried, tried jumping, didn't work. Eventually the little girl started crying. She said, I can't get up there. And then her dad said, sorry, <clears throat> her dad said, did you try asking your father? <clears throat> so his daughter stood there, this hopeless task in front of her. But she didn't have to do it on her own. Because he could pick her up and just carry her up the stairs, right? <clears throat> And it's like that for us. We have this task, and it's, it's hopeless. Jesus said, be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. He said, let your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. I can't do that. That's hopeless. I could sit there, and maybe I could think in my own pride, oh, all I need to do is I need to build a... I need to build a, a bigger trampoline so I can get to the top of the stairs. Maybe if I really train hard, if I do, if I do lots of squats, I can jump up to the top of the stairs. Maybe if, I, if I design, I'm really intelligent so I can design a new tool that will bring me up to the top of the stairs. But the truth is we can't make it. But what we need to do is ask the Father. Right? So if you have pride, you cannot come to God. You cannot come to Jesus because your pride won't let you. So this is a tremendous, tremendous problem in the world. It actually defeats the gospel. Have you tried asking the Father? Right. And some people even tell me, they say, no, I'm, I can't ask God. That guy's a jerk. He made mosquitoes. I don't like mosquitoes, and therefore I'm smarter than he is. Right? Like, I'm serious. And that, that is pride. You see that? So for us, what's the solution to pride? You have a question, Fred? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Try asking the Father. Okay, okay. What's the solution to pride? What is the solution for us when we think we already know all the answers? What do we do when we think, oh, I know best. I'm only going to listen to teachers that tell me what itching ears want to hear. What do we do in those situations? Well, I don't usually do this, but I'm going to give you a secular solution. I know if, if you don't want to listen to worldly wisdom, you can tune this out. It's okay. But here's the secular solution. It's go outside. 
And why do I say that? Because nobody, I got another picture here, nobody stands next to the Grand Canyon and says, wow, I'm so wonderful. Right? So get outside. Go stand in a lake. Go look at how big the, the heavens are. Right? Go hug a tree and think that tree has been there 200 years. Right? Go stand on a mountain. Get off of your smartphone. Get off of the television. Get off of the internet. Because all that's going to tell you is, yeah, you're important. What you think matters. That's all your opinion. That's the only thing. Right? Get outside. Anyways, that's a secular solution. But this is a church, so of course we have to talk about the, the other solution. Because there is one person who can stand next to the Grand Canyon and say, wow, I'm so awesome. Do you know who that is? Jesus, God, yes, it's Jesus, right? He is the image of the invisible God. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Through him, all things were created, right? He is infinite. That means he has no limit. He is omnipotent. That means he is all-powerful, he is unfathomable. That means you cannot reach the bottom of him. You cannot fa fathom him out. He is immortal. That means he is always has been and always will be. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three persons who together are one God. He created the Grand Canyon, and he created Lake Temiskaming, and he created you. Now, if there was ever a, a man who could be prideful, it would be him. But Jesus was not prideful. Here's what Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 1. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He humbled himself for us. He was in heaven, the most wonderful place you could be. And he came to earth. He took on a human form. He had to be hungry. He had to weep. He had to know all these the things that we have to deal with on a daily basis for us. He did that for you. And he went to the cross. That was the author of life hanging on a tree. Right? The creator of all mankind destroyed by his own people. The king of kings serving sinners. He knew we were struggling with pride. So he came not only to take our pride and nail it to the cross, but he also came to show us the solution. Humility. Counting others more significant than ourselves. He showed his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's why we come to the Lord's table. A remembrance of his last night before the cross and a memorial to his humble sacrifice, showing us that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. So I'll invite... Uh,